Well, if you've been with us these last five or six weeks, or you've been following on our YouTube channel, you'll know that we've been looking at the gifts of the Spirit in many different aspects. And it's very fitting that today, when many people in the church, most of the church is celebrating the day of Pentecost, that we talk about gifts. Pentecost from Acts 2 was when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. People got baptized in the Holy Spirit and started doing great things for God. And so today's message will be on the operation of gifts, how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. I want to give some scriptural examples. I want to give lots of personal examples as well. Um, and we'll also answer the question of how do we operate in the gifts? And really the question, the, the answer to that question um, in summary form, I think is just in, there's one really good passage which we're going to start with. Um, and it's really a one point sermon uh, on that question. So please turn with me to John chapter two. This is the water into wine incident at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. So Jesus and his mum were at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And in John chapter two, verse three, we'll pick up the story. It says they were at the wedding and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. I think Mary must have looked at him and kind of winked, like giving him a glance. You know, they've got no wine, wink, wink, what are you gonna do? And he knew, cause he answered like that. He said, you know, what's that got to do with me? Anyway, his mother seems to have just let that go because she says to the servants, and this is the key phrase, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. And then there were six water pots of stone and it goes on, we know the story. Jesus said, fill them up. And then the servants did. And then he said, take the, take it to the, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they did. And it turned into wine and the, the master of ceremonies proclaimed what great wine it was. A wonderful miracle. Um, and I'd like to point out that Jesus didn't actually touch anything. Who was it who did the miracle, who actually did the doing? It was the servants. And what were they commanded to do? How did they do the doing of the miracle? Well, it was what Mary says, whatever he says to you, do it. They were obedient and the miracle happened in their hands as they did what Jesus told them to do. And this is a, a very powerful image, a picture, I believe, of how the gifts of the Spirit operate. And in summary, how do you move in the gifts of the Spirit? Well, whatever God tells you to do, go do it. Obedience uh, and listening to God and just doing what he says. And later we're going to categorize the different kinds of the gifts of the Spirit. But that same summary applies to all of them. Whatever he says, go do it. So one of the questions I think this raises, uh, and rightly so, is that how do we hear from God? Well, we could do a 12-week series on that, or even a whole year of, of preaching on how to hear from God. For now, I'll just summarize it. Some people will hear God in, in dreams. Some people have visions when they're awake. Some people will even hear an audible voice from God. Um, one of the very best ways we can all hear from God is by reading the word. The Bible is the word of God speaking to us on every page. That's a really important way. But for many of us, and this is something that, um, as well as the word, often God will use to speak to me, it's like a spirit to spirit communication like inside, you know, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you're born again this morning, you have the Holy Spirit in you already and he communicates inside. And so for me, uh, this is, you know, when, you, when you're thinking, you've got lots of thoughts in juggling around in your head. That's just normal thinking. That's how we think. Um, and words come in and they go, that's just normal. But sometimes, particularly when I'm asking God something, words will come to me and I can recognize that they have a different origin. They didn't come from me. 
And it's just a case of listening and keep listening over all the years that you're a Christian and you'll get better at understanding how God speaks to you. Um, so that's just me. He'll invade my thoughts and I'll recognize that the words came from somewhere that weren't me. Um, that may be your experience or there may be many other ways that God speaks to you. And that's all I'd like to say about that now. So how do we operate in the gifts? It is super important that you get baptized in the Holy Spirit if you want to operate in spiritual gifts. Super important. It's not a prerequisite like you have to. So I've been in meetings where people who don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit would sit around in a group and would pray for somebody to be healed. And that person would get healed, either in the room or at a distance. You know, there are there are many examples that people here could probably think of where, you know, God has, has intervened in response to prayer. And that's, you know, God does that. But it's a, it's a massive acceleration of the gifts and the operation of the Spirit in our lives to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus put it this way. When he came back after he'd risen again and he came to teach the disciples in Acts verse 1, in verse uh, chapter 1, in verse 5, he said, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And a few verses later in verse 8, he says, you shall receive power. That's dynamite, explosive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And I don't think it's any accident that Jesus used the same word baptism. We believe that baptism in water is full immersion. We take the person, we, we bring them down into the water. They get completely wet, totally soaked to the skin. They get inundated with water. It's in the clothes. It's in the hair or the beard if they've got one. It's in their nose and the ears. It's absolutely everywhere. That's baptism in water. And it's exactly the same picture. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we get completely immersed, completely inundated with the Spirit. And he's on us, he's on our clothes, he's in our beard, he's in our ears and our nose, just to use the same example. He's all over us, and it's a big acceleration. I think an example I was thinking of just to compare these, it's like you can get your head wet by putting it under the kitchen sink tap. Just dunk your head under there, you're going to get a wet head, okay? But you'll also get a wet head if you stand under a massive waterfall. You'll still get wet. The, water, the waterfall will totally inundate you. You'll be soaked to the skin, you know, totally. There's nothing that's not wet. And I think that's a good picture, uh, just a way of understanding um, the difference. You, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit. He's there. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. But there's something else, and Jesus uh, taught us that we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and have an, an extra experience beyond, beyond salvation and baptism in water. There's more, and it's for everybody. Nobody is excluded. And if you look at examples in the book of Acts, I'm just going to point you to them now. Um, so in Acts 2, we get the very famous story of Pentecost. So what happened? The, the Holy Spirit came upon the people there, the disciples. They started speaking in tongues and the people around them from, from all around in Jerusalem recognized the languages. Um, and then Peter got, he stood up and preached and many people were saved and it goes on. Um, in the other two examples, they were speaking in tongues as well. So uh, Acts 10 tells us a story of a Roman called Cornelius who was godly and had asked Peter or God asked Peter to come and uh, and to speak to them and he he'd gathered together his family and his friends and everybody um, and Peter was preaching and it says whilst he was preaching the Holy Spirit came upon everybody and they started speaking in tongues and giving glory to God and uh, Peter said well let's let's get them baptized in water and and the Holy Spirit was poured out on them there. And a similar thing happened in Ephesus 
in when the church there was very early, when it was first getting kicked off, Paul went there in Acts 19 and he said to them, have you guys heard of the Holy Spirit? And they said, well, we've not really heard of that. He said, well, what, what have you been baptized into? He said, well, just John's baptism. Um, and Paul said, well, that was just a baptism for repentance. And then he taught, he taught them what it was really all about, Jesus, and get baptized in water. And it said he laid hands on them and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. So in each case, um, speaking in tongues accompanies the baptism in the Holy Spirit um, and also other gifts like in, in Ephesians there, in the Ephesian church, um, prophecy. Um, and this is our experience in the churches as well, that when somebody gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get the ability to speak in tongues and that's unknown language. Language is unknown to you. And why do we do this? Why is this a thing? What's it useful for? Well, if we read 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4, it tells us, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Edifies means builds up on the inside, strengthens. So if you ever feel like you want to be strengthened and built up, there's one surefire way based on the Bible here that you can build yourself up. Speak in tongues. That's going to build you up on the inside. And God gives us this gift for our own use. And in, in the Bible examples and in, in our experience, everyone who gets baptized in the Holy Spirit has the ability to do this. And it's, it's your, your own, your own pre, uh, praying to God where God gives you uh, language in a supernatural way. Okay. So now we're going to go to the chapter that we've been looking at quite a bit in these last several weeks. That's um, 1 Corinthians 12. If you turn with me, please. 1 Corinthians 12 gives us a list of gifts of the Spirit. It's not all of the gifts of the Spirit. You'll find others throughout the Bible. But for some reason, I think on really on purpose, God chose these to explain to us because it covers um, a, a wide range of what he uses us with. It's significant he's selected these ones, I believe, because um, it helps us recognize them. It helps us understand what's going on. Um, and it also helps us to know what to do because the Bible teaches us that we have to do certain things. Uh, in response to a prophetic word. If it, for example, uh, a prophetic word should be judged by other prophetic people. Uh, it doesn't say that about some of the other gifts. Um, and then tongues in public use need to be interpreted. There's a right administration for how the gifts are used. And so he explains them to us in this form so that we can understand. So let's read then um, 1 Corinthians 12. Let's start at verse 7 but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all and then it's going to start listing them so let's count them so for one is given for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit another gift of healings by the same spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all things, distributing to each individually as he wills. So there's nine gifts listed there. And in order to help us understand these, let's split them into three threes, because I think there are some commonalities in triplets of these gifts. We could talk about the speaking gifts. So that would be prophecy, tongues and interpretation. These are all gifts of supernatural speech. We could talk about the knowing gifts. So that would be the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom and the gift of discernment. And we could talk about what I've called the, the power gifts. So that's faith, healing, and miracles. These are just my labels. They're not in the Bible, but I think they're, they're useful to help us understand what's going on. Um, and we're going to look at each of these gifts now in those categories. I'm going to give some biblical and some personal examples, and we'll see 
really how they operate. That's that's the aim this morning. By God's grace, over the many years I've been a Christian, he's used me in all of the gifts of the Spirit, um, and some of them much more than others. And often that's the way that God works with us. So for me, um, I can't even count the number of times he's given me a prophetic word or a tongues and interpretation. Um, the other gifts of the Spirit, I could point to specific examples. So maybe much less, but uh, those speaking gifts seems to be the ones that God uses me in the most. It's not my gifts. These are God's gifts. Um, but I believe he's built my faith and my understanding and knowledge in those areas to be able to uh, allow me to, you know, do that more, han handle more of those things. Um, and everybody's different in that. And you'll there'll be people who have specifically uh, a great deal of uh, use of the gift of healing or word of knowledge or wh whatever it is everybody's different and there's a great diversity in the church so let's start by talking about prophecy I think a, a simple way of understanding this is basically God tells you something and you tell other people that's really what it boils down to God tells you like this morning there was a prophetic word uh, you know God God said say this and then that person said that that's really that's all that is and there are many ways this this happens so I've got a couple of biblical examples here sometimes it happens right in the moment of speaking and sometimes ahead of time maybe a long time ahead of time so for example 2 Peter 1 verse 21 says prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So speaking as moved by the Holy Spirit is an example of uh, in the moment. You know, that's, an, that's when God is speaking to you now for a speech to be given now. But Ezekiel is a different example. So in Ezekiel 21 verses 2 to 3, God tells Ezekiel, Set your face towards Jerusalem. Preach against the holy places and prophesy against the land of Israel and say to the land of Israel, thus says the Lord. And it goes on and that's the message, whatever that message is. But can you see it says, set your face, preach against certain places, prophesy in the land of Israel. This isn't just a now word. God is giving Ezekiel a word, a prophetic word that he has to take out. And over the next days and weeks and months and maybe even years, um, he's going to uh, give that prophetic word to the people. And the, these are all ways that it happens. Sometimes prophetic words are now, or God is saying to you right now that this is what he wants you to know. Or sometimes it's future. God says that in a year, this is going to happen. And both those are perfectly fine, valid, normal. We see examples in the Bible and we see examples in our experience as well. And the form, the, the way that the gift operates comes in great diversity because there's a diversity of people. Um, and so, for example, if you look at some Old Testament prophet or, or prophets in the Bible throughout, you'll see they're very demonstrative. So they may say, they may rise up and say, bind this man's hands with a belt. And then say, the owner of this belt will have his uh, hands bound and will be led where he doesn't want to go and it's a prophetic word and that's fine it may come a different way but that's how it came there there was a there was an old testament prophet who led on one side led down on his one side for a couple of years as a demonstration of a prophetic word another one was told to marry a prostitute and to love her and then when she abandons you, when she cheats on you, this will be a prophetic demonstration of how God feels when his people cheat on him. Uh, a, a grand dem demonstrative word. And, and sometimes that happens. It's in the Bible. Occasionally we see it in our experience. I've not seen that too much. What's much more common is that people will say either uh, you'll say uh, God says this and then just speak for God so often that's how it happens doesn't have to be that way if you've got a prophetic word and honestly you might be a bit nervous about saying God says because 
you're not too experienced or you're not too sure, that's absolutely fine. Um, just give it as, I, I, I believe God wants us to know that he, he loves us and he wants us to, whatever it is, I just, I just really feel that God wants us to know this. It doesn't have to come with great ceremony. It doesn't have to come with King James language. It doesn't have to come with prophetic demonstration and props. It really doesn't. It can do. But whatever is, whatever is comfortable for you, really, that's what God wants you to do to give that word. Okay, so there's many different forms, but essentially prophetic words are God tells you something and you tell the other people. Okay. So let's talk now about tongues and interpretation. These always come together. So we've already talked about the personal tongues that is the evidence of the baptism in the Spirit that we all get when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. We can all do that. That's related but slightly different. Um, and if you read 1 Corinthians 14, so we just turn the page. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, 27. And it's saying how your meetings should be. And he's going along and says, when you come together, each of you has these different things. 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at most three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. And let two or three prophets speak, and others will judge. And it goes on and explains how we should be uh, in our meetings. And so... There's, a, there's an, a, an activity of the gift of tongues that is for the edification, the building up of others. Um, and in many ways, when a tongue is interpreted, it, it comes like a prophetic word, actually. Um, often a tongue being interpreted is uh, a God to man message, although sometimes it can also be a man to God prayer that we get let in on by the interpretation. So the way that we can recognize the difference is, is just our, our administration really. In a meeting, we'll, many of us will be speaking in tongues when we get together. If someone gets the microphone and stands up and starts speaking in tongues in a way that is clearly taking the focus and that we can all hear, then what should we do? We should wait, listen, hear, and then we should wait for a, an interpretation of those tongues so that everything's done in good order. It must be interpreted. And one thing you might notice um, from, from our experience, you might even get something from the tongue itself, even if you don't know what it means. There's a communication from heaven that comes spirit to spirit. And we'll, you can often get something even before it's interpreted. But then the interpretation must come and then our understanding catches up and we get the understanding as well. Um, so, yeah, for, so let's move quickly on to interpretation because it's related. Sometimes that's the same person. Sometimes that's a different person. Both those things can happen. The way it works for me is that um, often I'll get those things together. I'll get a tongue and an interpretation and I'll know what it means. Um, and sometimes I even just get the interpretation first and it, it's kind of like a prophecy and God will tell me actually that's not a prophecy that's an interpretation you're going to give the tongues and then the interpretation and so in a sense tongues plus interpretation is kind of like prophecy and it gives us a message and it often brings another dimension a different dynamic when this is uh, used in in the church Okay, so we're still on the, uh, well, we've done the, the, we've done the three gifts of uh, speaking, the speaking gifts. Let's, let's now move on to the knowing gifts. So that's knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. Let's look at the discernment first. S sorry, uh, no, let's take knowledge. That's the next one on my list here. So there's a really good example in Matthew 17, verse 27. And this was, it was tax time. Jesus was around with uh, with Peter. It was time for them to pay their taxes. And Jesus told Peter to catch a fish, open its mouth, you'll find a coin. It's about twice as much as you'll need for one person. So use it to pay for our taxes. Wow. 
Like that's isn't that amazing? Such a bizarre, a miraculous way of paying tax. So it's a, I'm using it as an example of a word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is the gift to know something that you would never know except that God has given it you. Who would know that there's a fish in the sea with a coin stuck in its mouth? Who would know that? Nobody except God. And by the way, when Jesus was moving in these gifts, it wasn't in his omniscience that he did them. He did them as an example of a man completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit, moving in the gifts. Jesus is a great example for us. Don't think that just because he was God and is God, uh, he's not a great example. No, he was a man, fully man, moving in the gifts of the Spirit. So he moves in a gift of knowledge, but also he immediately had a, a, a gift of wisdom as well. Not only did he know what the situation was, he knew how to uh, interpret it, how to apply it and make it happen. He said to Peter, go catch it. It's the first one. I open the mouth and there it is. And go pay the taxes. So the word of knowledge working with the word of wisdom. And then you have to describe this as a miracle because what a miraculous way of paying taxes that Jesus had there for the two of them. And you'll see very many times the gifts of the Spirit work together. They come together. They happen at the same time. They're complementary. They, uh, they follow one another. They even inspire one another. Often someone will get up and prophesy and don't you feel a stirring in your heart for another word? Well, great. That's how it's supposed to be. Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. Let's consider it for a little while. Let's judge it. Now then, another prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. That's what we were just reading in 1 Corinthians 14. You can all prophesy um, in turn. So gifts working together. And you'll see this again and again. Um, I'm, I'm trying to give personal examples of these, each of the gifts as we go through. So for me, this I've not seen this particularly often in my own life. Um, for me, it's when I've given a prophetic word in a church meeting. And God has also given me a name of, a, of an individual who I don't know who this prophetic word was specifically for. Um, and I've, you know, give the prophetic word and then call out that name and say, you know, God says this is specifically for you, John or Fred or Sally or whoever it is. Um, and often that that is extremely powerful for that person because it's, you know, God knows me. God sent someone for me. Um, so I've, I've seen that. I know people who, who moved in the word of the knowledge all all day every day many many times especially evangelists it's a very powerful gift um and you know that's that's great in uh, in in telling the gospel with these kind of signs following so let's talk about the gift of wisdom it's a similar gift um actually a good really good example we've already looked at in john 2 when we talked about water into wine so mary told jesus they have no wine and Jesus says, what has that got to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And now I believe Mary moving in wisdom, in a gift of wisdom, even though Jesus had said, what's that got to do with me? She knew somehow, and I believe this was a gift of wisdom. She said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And, and can you see now this caused a, a rise in Jesus's spirit? It must have done because he went along with it. He said, well, okay, uh, fill the water pots. There's another gift of wisdom, isn't it? And then uh, draw some out and take it to the feast master. Wisdom. And the end result was a miracle. So the faith of Mary and the moving in that gift of the spirit of wisdom triggered a gift of wisdom, and another, another gift of wisdom, and a miracle. And this is how it works. Gifts will trigger other people, will... will it's a stirring and a, and a stirring of faith. That's what it is. Um, so my example of the gift of wisdom, um, I do a lot of leading of worship in our meetings, as many of you know. Um, the gift of wisdom is very important in leading worship. Uh, leading worship, it's not just about singing songs, do the next song, now we've finished. Um, I believe it's really important to be sensitive to what God's doing and to what what we're feeling as a congregation 
and to understand what is the right response to this. What is God doing now? What does God want us to do? This takes wisdom. And I've been doing it for a long time, but I, I believe the, the, the best worship leader, the most gifted worship leader is, is Tina. And you'll see this when she leads meetings. We, you'll, you'll, you'll feel that she just knows what the right thing is to do next. Do we pray now? Do we stop? Are we quiet? Do we need to uh, shout or, or bow down or whatever it is? You'll see many worship leaders. This is a, a gift that is used a great deal, as well as word of knowledge. You know, there's somebody in the meeting who has a prophetic word. We all need to be quiet. You know, that sometimes happens. Uh, prophetic words or discernment. These are all um, in action in, in worship and many more. And that's another topic that we could do 12 weeks on, no problem. Okay, then let's come to the third of those knowing gifts, the gift of discernment. And there's a really good example in Acts 16, verse 17. There was, uh, Paul and Silas were going around preaching, and there was a girl who was following them around, saying some wonderful things. She said, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Just imagine if you were preaching the gospel, someone followed you around and all they ever said was, this person, a servant of the Most High God, is proclaiming the way of salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it sounds good, but Paul was moving in the gift of discernment and understood the motivation of where that word came from in the woman. And guess what? He cast a demon out of her. Now, how many of us would have realized, just using our thinking brains, that someone who's following us around saying such wonderful things, it was coming from a demon? How would you know? Well, this is why we have the gift of discernment. Also, You could also translate it distinguishing between spirits. Uh, understanding the motivations and the hearts of men and women and children. Um, and these kind of things. And it's a, it, it doesn't come up that often. I've not seen it personally too often, uh, but it's sometimes it's the exact gift that's needed in a situation and God will bring it um, and it will be it will be powerful. My own personal example of, of this uh, is when I was really young, I was about 19, um, young and immature and didn't really know anything. Uh, I was helping run an alpha course. I was one of the sub leaders um, and there was a, an experienced leader there. And I'd missed the first week uh, but that I was there at the second. And apparently in that first week, there was a couple that came from outside the church and they were asking questions and leading the discussion in a disruptive way. They were polite, but they were trying to turn it down a different direction than what we were looking at in, in the Bible that day. So the second week came and I was there and they started again to lead us in a certain direction. And the leader, he, he cut them off and said, look, thank you for that, but we're going to stick on this topic. We're not going to talk about those things that you want to discuss. I hope that's okay. And, and I thought, well, that's quite rude. Why would, why would we not let these people just talk? I was, I was immature and didn't really know. Uh, and so I talked to them, and at the end I talked to them, and I even let them persuade me to come back to the house uh, after the meeting in the evening and when I got there it was a very strange situation because there were four young couples all married in living in a commune with one guy who was uh, clearly a leader a very dynamic uh, kind of guy big a big guy and it was some kind of religious cult setup honestly I, I don't really know what it was it didn't seem you know, they weren't doing terrible things, but it was obviously a religious cult kind of thing. And uh, so we talked and things, and, and at the end we prayed. And, and when we prayed, this guy, who was the, clearly the leader, as he prayed, um, he was praying something that was slightly strange. And God opened my eyes and showed me. And I saw like a vision when we were awake kind of thing. And I saw like a like a, an octopus thing with tentacles. That was just the way that God showed me speaking through him like the tentacles in all 
through his mouth and all these kind of things. That, for me, was God showing me clearly the motivation of what was going on in this kind of little cult setup. Um, it was, I, I'm absolutely sure it was a demon speaking. And there was no great testimony of casting out or anything. We just said goodbye and that was it. That's the end of the story. Um, but God used that situation to help me understand a couple of things. Firstly, what is the, the gift of discernment? I believe clearly I, I, I know and I can always think of that example. But also I, re- I look back and I recognize the leader was moving in gift of wisdom. And I just didn't notice it because I was young and inexperienced. And what we should have done was we should have you know, kept away from what they were talking about and just moved on. Anyway, I went back to them and apologized you know, afterwards and, and I did learn. Um, you know, but God will give us these things when we need them. He doesn't just give us random gifts at random times. It's always uh, in order to achieve what God has in, in his objectives. Okay, so then finally we come to these power gifts. Uh, that's miracles, healings, and faith. Um, the best example of miracles in the Bible, of course, is Jesus who went around doing all kinds of miracles, water into wine, catch of fish, feeding of the 5,000, raising the dead, all the things that he did. Read the Gospels and you'll see them again and again and again. But also, I would suggest you take a look at Elijah and Elisha from the Old Testament. If you start reading around 1 Kings 17 and go and read the next 10 or 20 chapters all the way into 2 Kings, you'll find that between them they did many miracles. They... uh, they had a miraculous provision of flour and oil during a drought for uh, a widow. They, well, first of all, Elijah raised the dead. He called down fire from heaven at Mount Carmel. He parted the Jordan like Moses parted the Red Sea. Um, he healed a water supply. And then Elisha picks up when Elijah goes to heaven and he has a miraculous provision of oil. He raises the dead. Uh, He removes poison from a stew. He feeds a hundred, like Jesus fed 5,000. And he made an axe head float, a metal axe head float in water. And all kinds of things. Miracles you'll find in the Gospels, but you'll also find in the Old Testament. And it seems specifically concentrated about the ministries of these people. Um, In my own experience, I've not really seen many miracles. uh, But there is one story I... I was once, when I was young, I was going to a, a Bible conference with uh, a girl, uh, one, of, uh, one of the people from church, and her mother, and m- her mother was driving the car. And they were telling me on the way that the car had been in the garage, and the mechanics had said, look, the car is really on its last legs, it's about to die. Um, the next time it dies, really, there's nothing we can do, it's just going to die, and, and that'll be the end of it, you have to get a new car. And so we're going along, and guess what happens? The car dies, uh, totally dead. He tried and tried, waited a bit and tried, and there's just nothing happening with this car, and we're going to be stuck. So the the girl and her mum really were leading this. I was just following, so I didn't really know what was going on. But they got out of the car, and we lifted the bonnet. We laid hands on the car engine, put the bonnet down, got back in the car, and started it first time, no problem, and drove all the way there and all the way back home without any problems. And so for me, that was that was a miracle. And you know, God intervened in something that really should not have happened. Something that physical laws seem seem to not really allow. That's really what a miracle is. It's when God steps in and does something that shouldn't be. That for all that we know and understand, this cannot happen. And God intervenes. Um, another example, uh, another gift that Jesus is a great example of, of course, is healing. He's, he's probably the best example in the Bible of, of all of the gifts. We didn't hear him speaking in tongues, actually, just as a, as a note. But he's, he's an example of all, almost all of the gifts, but most clearly healing. It says in Acts 10, um, he went about doing good and healing all. Everyone who came to Jesus would be healed when he when he ministered to them um, and so he's a great example there and we see this in the church today um, I've seen enough healings of all types to know that God heals today this isn't just consigned to the history books this isn't just in the gospel God heals today 
And there are many kinds of healings that he would perform. If someone has a headache, we will pray for them. And the headache goes away, praise God, they're whole again. Would it have gone away anyway? Maybe. I don't mind. It doesn't matter. We still pray for them and they end up restored. When we pray for healing, we're not just looking for proof of God's existence every time. That's not all it's about. Now, sometimes he really will do an undeniable miracle of healing. But we'll pray for headaches. We'll pray for doctors. We love doctors. We've got many doctors around the church. Um, God uses doctors. If someone's going for an operation, we'll pray for them that God will help the doctors to perform the duties well and that everything will go well. That doesn't take away anything from God that he uses doctors. Would it have happened anyway? Maybe, but we know from who we know God is that he is incredibly interested in our lives and in the lives of all people, whether they know him or not. God really loves everybody and he wants healing to come whatever way it comes. Sometimes there's those extremely unlikely remissions or recoveries that maybe occasionally happen in medical science, but is incredibly rare. And we pray for those and we see those breakthroughs. And then those undeniable miracles of healing of things that would never, we would never get healed. Things where there are just miraculous changes in people's bodies. Um, and there are, there are many testimonies of those in the church. We've seen some of those in this church. Um, my own personal testimony is that God did something like that for me when I was uh, 19. I just came to university. Throughout my teenage years, I'd had a, a quite a serious back condition and I was in uh, a, a, quite a lot of pain quite a lot of the time. And I was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis, which is quite a difficult disease and it has no cure, at least that, that's what I understood when I'd had it. Um, and I was supposed to get worse and worse until when I was this age, I am now, I should probably not be walking. Maybe my spine would be fused and, you know, the kind, all kinds of problems can come from that. Well, in, in April 1996, um, I was in a church meeting and there was someone there who knew I'd had this problem. And I believe had a gift of faith. And they said to me, Mark, God is going to heal that tonight. Uh, and so he said, lie down on the floor. So I laid on the floor. He prayed for me, laid hands on me. And when I got up, I was totally free, totally healed from pain and suffering. And it wasn't like a gradual decline in pain and, you know, gradually get better. It was a total cutting off, uh, an undeniable miracle that, uh, and I've never had any problem ever since. Not, not a single thing in all my years. So I know God does this and he can do this for everybody. He can do this for you. Praise God. And then finally we come to the, the ninth one, the last one I'm gonna talk about, faith. The gift of faith, what does this mean? Well, the way it was explained to me, I think is a very good, a very good way to understand. It, it's to be supernaturally emptied of all doubt. If you think of it that way, to be supernaturally emptied of all doubt, the gift of faith. And a biblical example is, is Abraham. We can read in Romans 4, verse 19 to 22. It says that Abraham was old. He was 100. And his wife was a similar age. And she'd stopped having kids years ago. And they were still childless. But it says there in Romans, Abraham did not waver but he was strengthened in his faith and stayed fully convinced. And that's what the gift of faith gives us. Despite everything, despite the odds, despite the situation, we stay fully convinced, strengthened in faith, not wavering. And it's, it's related to the faith that we all have. If you're born again this morning, if you know God, you've got faith. You, have, you had to have faith to come to know Jesus. Um, and it's like that, but it's just a massive ramp up of that in an instant. And um, yeah, and Abraham then obviously became father of many nations. He had, uh, he had Isaac and Ishmael and, and other sons and daughters, and he was a significant father of the faith. 
So for me, I've, I've got a couple of examples of this. Um, so my wife and I really struggled for about two years to have kids at all. Um, and I was at a church meeting at a Bible week one, one time when we were young. Uh, and sat next to me was Richard Annis, the leader of King's Church, some of you know. And we were listening to some sermon. I don't know what the sermon was, but the preacher said something. And suddenly faith hit me like a like a brick in in the in the head like bang and it, it must have hit richard as well at the same time because he turned to me and said mark you're going to be a dad and i said i know and and it just struck us like that and then that very day we conceived jamie my oldest son and you know there's with the dates and timings and things you can work these things out it couldn't have been any other day that very day uh, we conceived Jamie and now we've got three wonderful kids um, and you know God sorted that out so that was two gifts working together the gift of faith also the gift of prophecy Richard telling me you're gonna be a dad the gift of prof uh, prophecy and my faith the gift of faith and God brought it about and the other example I'd like to give of the gift of faith and other gifts is uh, a situation with my own mother, uh, a story I've told you before in, in a preach um, last year. So she called me on the phone and said, are you, you know, are you alone? What, can, can we have a chat or something? I'll call you later. And before she called me back, God told me as clear as day that she had cancer. But don't worry, she'll be fine. And, and, and I was sure, I was fully convinced by what God said. Um, for me, that was... Uh, word of knowledge God told me she had cancer I didn't know that that but don't worry word of wisdom she will be fine prophetic word and I was fully convinced it's a gift of faith of surety of emptying of doubt and so when she called me back later she said Mark I've got cancer I said I know God told me but he said don't worry you'll be fine and and from that point I was fully sure now my my mum had a had a different journey through that and we've I've spoken a little bit about that and you, and uh, but but for me from that point I'd never worried about the outcome and so she went through an operation and and she it must be I don't know 10 or 15 years now totally cancer free she's fine and uh, no problems at all you know God God is very gracious and uh, that kind of news can unnerve you it can unseat you it can cause you to worry but right from the start for me God gave me that faith that just held me throughout it there was no question in my mind that she was going to get well praise God so I'd just like to finish with one short passage from 1 Corinthians 14 there's a right way to use spiritual gifts there's got to be order uh, especially when we're in the church together and we're all keen to do it. There's, there's got to be a right way to do that. And Paul spells it out in 1 Corinthians 14. If you read the whole chapter and around, you, you get the impression that the Corinthians must have been doing, they must have been doing everything in tongues. And they were getting drunk on the wine and not waiting for each other in the, to have the bread and wine. And it, it was like a uproar of a meeting. And so... Paul gave some specific instructions and let's read from 26 it says okay how is it then brothers whenever you come together each of you has a psalm a teaching a tongue a revelation an interpretation let all things be done for edification that's the point it's not just for messing around it's not just for showing off there's only one reason that you do these gifts it's for the building up of the church okay edification if anyone speaks in a tongue this is the gift of tongues um, let there be two or at most three, each one in turn, let one interpret. <coughs> but if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and God. Let two or three prophets speak and let others judge. Others, if you look at the Greek, there's a bit more in that. It's, it's alos, it's others of the same kind. So that's other prophetic people. It doesn't have to be the leaders, but typically the leaders are prophetic people anyway. So two or three prophets are going to speak and then we'll judge and make sure we understand what's going on. If anything is revealed to another who's, who's sitting down, let the first one keep silent. 
For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And then you can't say that you're, you're just prophesying so you didn't have any control. I didn't lose self-control. Like, I, oh, I just went off on one. I couldn't control myself. No. The Bible says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So you can bring your own self-control and sit down at the right time, stand up at the right time, and do things in an orderly way. Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as was in all the churches of the saints. And then let's just finish with verse 39 and 40. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. This is a command in the Bible. We are to earnestly, honestly desire, want to prophesy. And do not forbid to speak in tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order this is the right way to move in the gifts of the spirit and then that verse about earnestly desiring is is a repeat of verse one of the same chapter where it says pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you'll prophesy i want to encourage you all this morning if you're not saved this morning go get saved if you're not baptized in water, go get baptized in water. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, go get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And for all of the all of you, let's do what God's telling us to do here. Desire spiritual gifts. This is something that's for everybody. And here, Paul is actually elevating prophecy. He's saying especially prophecy. And I believe that everybody, everybody can do this. Prophetic gifts are for all. There's no barrier as to uh, leaders and not leaders, male and female, old and young. Children can prophesy. Did you know that, children? You can prophesy. And God will show you how to do it. So, whatever he says, you go do it. And that's how we operate in the spiritual gifts. Amen.